Hi, my name is Bob Greenier, and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. I'm at, I am here at the pleasure of Carmen Miller, whose father invented the Mueller motor, and we are in her subterranean basement there, <laughs> here, and she's got something rather special to talk about right now. What is it? Well, we believe we have Nikola Tesla's lost prototype. We believe it corresponds to his patent number 382279, which was his very first patent on a rotary induction motor. He envisioned this patent while he was walking in Budapest with his uh, assistant Anthony Segetti, Anatoly Segetti, who was a Hungarian who was his lifelong assistant and friend. And he had famously described this to him in the sand and drew with it in the, in the, in the sand and said, I would like to show you, my friend, how I envision a rotating magnetic field. And he described to uh, him basically how he was going to harness the wheel work of nature, nature. And we believe that this is his vision of that embodied in this Tesla prototype. When you say this, we are referring to this little puppy over here. Yes. And uh, this is the patent. 382279, granted May 1st, 1888, applied for October 14th, 1887. So we believe it was made within that time frame mm -hmm. at one of Tesla's most destitute times of his life. He was digging ditches literally and was at his most destitute. But he had had this idea for over five years and he finally had scrapped together enough materials. We believe this could have some be the basis of a different DC motor where he uh, had recovered the materials to make this. It's a crude version, but we believe the knife switches and the monolithic base, as well as the fact that it corresponds exactly to figure 14 in that patent. And here you see in figure one, again, you see the rotor is um, made in the exact same configuration as what you see here. And it's a toroidal motor, as you can see, so a little bit relevant here to our weekend um, of discovery. And I thank Bob again for coming. It's Come been on. wonderful. It has Anyways, been. Um, the knife switches are very uh, similar to the ones that were uh, on the other prototype that is considered the first prototype of Nikola Tesla's, which was given to Professor Ayrton, and it resides at the British Museum and is available on display um, by request, I think. Um, but we believe that this precedes that motor. And we also would like to invite the whole in Tesla community and the world at large to challenge us and to also examine the evidence, because if there is even one nth of a degree percent that this could be Nikola Tesla's lost prototype. It deserves that and more. I agree. And you have a particular vision for this motor, right? Yes, I'd like it to be part of how we raise funds with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Research Project. I believe Bob has been really instrumental in helping get the word out about Tesla and all the other free energy over unity, uh, zero point energy researchers that have been out there. We thank Jean Manning for joining us this weekend, for also writing her books and making this a subject that has been able to be received by many people. Yes, I'm, I'm very grateful to all of you. And I do believe that this could help be a catalyst for us to help people remember and realize what Nikola Tesla contributed to our society every day that we sometimes attribute to other people, such as radio that was also um, credited to Guglielmo Marconi, and yes, he contributed some, but he also used Tesla's patents, and Tesla was granted the patents for radio. Post-mortem, if you don't realize, that's also not taught in schools. Tesla should be taught prolifically in our curriculums of electrical engineering. I think Professor Anthony would have liked that. I think Tesla would have liked that, and I think our future deserves that. So tell me, Carmen, how did you come by this device? Okay, I was in the right place at the right time. And this happened to be on the Pawn Stars Pawn Shop 
in Las Vegas one day when really? I was there in 2011, I believe. Mm -hmm. And I was there with my very good friend, Ray, I'll refer to him as, if you know, you know. <laughs> and uh, he was very generous and believed in me and believed in the fact that I knew what I was looking at and that Bill Weissach, who was the owner of this device, who is one of the greatest um, Tesla coil builders and researchers and teachers of Nikola Tesla. I was also, as I received and inherited uh, and became the steward of this device um, known as the Weissach uh, artifact, known as Nikola Tesla's lost prototype. And I believe that, it, and it, also the other researchers that I am furthering the research of are none other than Ken and Jim Corum, Jim Hardesty, Jeff Bahari. All of these people are very well known in the Tesla field. And they all believe, Mark Safer also believes um, that this has a very good chance of being Nikola Tesla's lost prototype, as well as Cameron Prince from Tesla Universe. He was interested in testing this device for DNA. Apparently they have Nikola Tesla's DNA on record, on file, and they would be able to cross-reference it in the event that we could find any DNA left under the windings, perhaps. Um, and if we could correspond to some of the materials used as per possibly Bessemer steel that was used at that time, or if we can determine the knife switches being similar to the ones, like I said, at, um, that was given to Professor Ayrton. So I do believe this deserves uh, us to invite the entire Tesla community around the world to continue to examine this evidence and to hopefully wrap a documentary around this device and the posterity of it and the history of it so that it can be going on record and that we could get the opinions of the old researchers that are still alive, uh, still on record while they're alive. That's my goal. And so the provenance of it, how did it find its way to you from where it resided before? Where did it reside before, to the oh, best of your yes. knowledge? Okay, so it came from Cornell University. It was and what found, was it doing there? It was found and bought by a couple that actually worked um, in a capacity of, uh, I think, um, janitorship in the um, Cornell University. And they so they happened... just bought it? They walk in and said, like, can I have that? Please? No, or... there was a rummage sale and it was called... A rummage sale? Yes. Uh... I mean, it was called Einstein's Attic. And, okay. Uh, apparently Cornell was famous for ha having these rummage sales yearly and it was often attended by people like Jim Hardesty and they bought priceless artifacts for pennies on the dollar <laughs> and uh, even Geisler tubes and things that you would never think of getting rid of nowadays um, were sold there and this was sold there for 75 cents and then it was put on sorry sorry what 75 cents so when that would have been in about uh, uh, 1997 Okay. And then they... Se sorry, even in 1997, 75 cents? 75 cents. Okay. And then in 1999, they decided eBay was a thing. Mm -hmm. So they were going to put it on eBay. So this couple put it on eBay and it was mislabeled as a rotary induction coil. And Bill Weissach happened to collect rotary induction coils. So he purchased and put, put a bid on this, actually knowing he, he looked at it in amazement and he said, oh my God... I think this is what I think it is. And he sent a picture of it off to um, Jim Hardesty, who actually worked at Cornell as well. Mm -hmm. And he thought it was the same. And he said, let's bid on it. And so Bill bid on it. Jeff Bahari was also bidding on it, but he backed off seeing that Bill was bidding on it. And Bill obtained it for $89. <laughs> so... Um, Yes, the claim to fame that Jim Hardesty has in this story is he did run actually around the block from his home. This item was residing on top of their TV when he went to go pick it up. Mm. So it was only a block and a half away from Jim and Judy Hardesty's home in, um, in uh, Ithaca, New York. So uh, having said that... Uh, Jim was the first excited person to receive it on behalf of Bill Weissach. And then Bill Weissach obtained it and they further did their research for the next few years until um, 
yeah, there was different circumstances. I'm not sure exactly without another chapter in this story. Mm -hmm. But yes, it's uh, on top of the research of these giants that I do and continue their research. I believe them. And that is mostly the reason why uh, I think this machine deserves more of a hard look by all the historians to see if it in fact could have all the earmarks uh, that Tesla would have put in his other devices. Well, from my point of view, having looked at it, and I'm no expert in Tesla's early construction methods, but I have seen a device uh, from Neil Crichton Gold's collection, which was from the late 1800s, and it was a spark gap, spark gap device. And typically they built these scientific demonstrators on a piece of wood, and you would imagine that's useful for any electrical component. So this kind of fits with it. They were often using um, these large physical type switches uh, and uh, brass, you know, uh, a tool maker's uh, piece of equipment. I don't know whether Tesla would have made this himself or he would have got an expert to I make that. I think it was his, mostly his, like we, we said we, he would have had a hand in making this, but he would have had Sigeti make it for him. We believe right. most Th of it. This is his Hungarian yes. friend. Yes, and right. if it was indeed a teaching model, as was suggested by Mark Patton Hall on the Pawn Stars, Pawn uh, Shop mm -hmm. show, uh, we believe that it would have had a maker's mark that was often done at the time. It, right. it, it would have been indicated who had made it okay. then. And there's other arguments of why that might not be feasible argument because Two phase and this particular design was so short lived, it would have been not made sense to s teach them a mm -hmm. technology that was no longer state of the art when Tesla's ideas had changed so fast. Mm -hmm. And it was found in situ in Cornell, and it would have been given to Professor Anthony as a gift because Tesla wanted Professor Anthony's endorsement. So, was there some sort of demonstration at Cornell of these devices? Well, I believe that he he had demonstrated it and Tesla. Uh, or Professor Anthony attests to that, that he had demonstrated these in the fall of When you say these, that, there's only one. There was two. Okay. The one that Professor Ayrton received that is on display in the British Museum. Okay. And this one that we believe is the lost prototype. Right. That Professor Anthony received at Cornell University. Okay, so I, I get the connection here. Now, yes. when I look at it, there are what appears to be um, some sort of wood or, or something here. Um, Bakelite. Yeah, pa possibly. Well, Bakelite would give it a date. Yes, so I, so I maybe need to, before that. Yes. People, people would need to check on uh, what and materials would be possible here. We discussed maybe taking a small Yeah, there's, there's, uh, for now. this <laughs> seems to be perishing, whatever this insulation is here. Mm -hmm. And it might be some for form of rubber. And there's some fragments down the bottom there. We might take a sample of that. And what I do notice over here is this side, it appears to have uh, some cotton thread mm -hmm. on here. And we did see this kind of insulation on this device that we received from Neil Crichton Gold. Mm -hmm. And that is correct uh, comparison to that other device for this kind of period. And this side, which is the opposite electrode, this actually has this rubber or whatever it is on. So it might be that this is the original kind of insulation and that this is not the original <laughs> kind of insulation. Um, but, you know, if we looked at the compound, maybe we would find out what that is. And then it seems to be like kind of shellacked or something on there. There's a kind of glossy sheen on the actual windings there. Uh, and people might be able to comment as to what that might be that is maybe providing some sort of insulation there on those windings. And, and then also there seems to be this kind of material in, that is on the bolts here. One thing that's notable about this device is that it doesn't seem to have any bearing. And my commentary on that is, well, if I was just making a functional prototype uh, that I was only, you know, wanting to show that it could rotate, would it matter if I had a bearing on there? And probably not. You know, you, you want to make this and just to test the principle and, and then demonstrate that principle. Now, how would this operate in your uh, understanding? Okay, well, that you have to again go a little bit back to the drawings and see here that it was ex how it was excited. This switch would have turned it in one direction, and again, for our posterity, we do as little of that as possible here. Um, and the other switch 
would have turned it in the other direction. Oh, okay, so that's uh, showing it, you know, uh, rotating around. So this, this was a, a this was Tesla's vision of a rotating magnetic field. Right, he, right. Yeah. Yeah. So he was simulating it, but mechanically doing yes, it. Yes, and he had applied for a patent previous to this, which was um, three eight nine uh, nine six eight three eight two nine six eight, uh, and this. They had asked him to take to disassemble it and to reapply for it in parts and pieces, and so this definitely corresponds. And then this was his very first patent that he had applied for on a rotating magnetic field. So it is the basis of all induction motors today. Well, that is an amazing thing. And Carmen, thank you very much for talking us through that. And your your vision for like we we discussed this uh, yesterday that you know you want to see this kind of technology brought out to the world. You've lived this your whole life, uh, really, and you want to see this potentially, if it uh, cannot be challenged and it is proven to m potentially find the right home uh, with a, a really truly interested party, as I understand it, and that then any funds raised could be used to uh, help uh, deliver the, the promise of the technology that your father instigated, right? Uh, absolutely. That's exactly what we're all here, having a meeting of the minds together, and we sure have. It's, it's been, been wonderful. wonderful. I'm lo losing my voice. <laughs> uh, anyways, yes, we've had a great time, and I'm gr so grateful to all of us that have come together here today. I'm Thank sure everyone in the community will hear about it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Carmen. Thank you too, Bob.